Welcome to tonight's free goalkeeping, United Goalkeeping Alliance parental education. And also, this isn't just for parents, for goalkeepers, and it's for clubs. Um, but what we're trying to do today is really help parents understand what the different leagues are all about here in the United States. There are plenty of them, um, and some of them are competitors, and some of them have are in the same cities and towns. So what are you looking for? What should you be looking for when it comes to the different leagues within the United States? Before we get rolling, I do just want to quickly speak to how you can become a member of the United Goalkeeping Alliance. If you'd like to grow your club, by all means, please reach out. We do have a revenue uh, generating service that we have been providing and has been successful with other with a lot of clubs. If your club's interested, by all means, please reach out. You see the information in the bottom left corner of your screen. And on the right side, you see the membership benefits to the United Goalkeeping Alliance. People who built this presentation are in front of you there. Uh, we have a great panel of goalkeeper coaches who are a part of the uh, build and support of tonight's presentation. Um, you see Brett Rosenberger, Chad Prickett, myself, Michael Kappas, and Paul Blodgett. What I'd like to do is just let the two goalkeeper coaches who are our UGKA board members, I should say, who are a part of this presentation tonight, introduce themselves. So before I do, I would never ask you to do something that I wouldn't do. So Coach Brett, Coach Paul, before you introduce yourself, I'm going to take the reins and do that myself. Everybody, my name is Eric Eisenhut. I am a proud member of the United Goalkeeping Alliance. I am at Robert Morris University here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on the women's side. I'm also in United States U Soccer, and I am a part of the Region East Goalkeeper Coaching Staff, as well as the Goalkeeping Director here at PA West. Coach Brett, can I turn it over to you, please, for introductions? Yeah, sure. Uh, Brett Rosenberger, originally from Brooklyn, New York, uh, played at Air Force Academy, then played pro here in the U.S. and then over in Germany. Um, have been back in the U.S. coaching pro in college and youth for the last 25 years. Um, right now at Cal State East Bay and MLS Next with uh, uh, Ballistic United. Um, so kind of all over the place, but flipped coast for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Paul Blodgett. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. I am also a proud member of the United Goalkeeper Alliance. And uh, I'm originally from outside of Rochester, New York, but I've been in Jersey since 1981 as the, I came as a goalkeeper coach, assistant coach at Rutgers <laughs> men's soccer program for over 20 years. And then I, after I left there, I went to the College of New Jersey women's team for 14 years. And I have my own goalkeeper school, and I am the director of goalkeeping for the boys and girls ODP program in New Jersey youth soccer. And I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Good to have you guys. And guys, we obviously have some subject matter experts here. Please, please ask questions as we move forward. So what you're going to see tonight from an agenda, uh, an agenda standpoint, um, we're going to get into the different leagues within the U.S. I'm going to give... a a, a literally a 10,000 foot overview as to what the leagues are, who they are, I should say, where they compete. Um, and, and literally that's not, I just want to introduce it because the next piece is the pyramid that we're going to work with. Coach Brett's going to present boys and girls pyramids on uh, the U S soccer pathways. And then where I want to speak to most of um, the session and answer your questions is what's the best pathway for you so based on the different leagues, based on the your your club teams in your area being part of these different leagues, what do they offer you? But that's great what they offer, but what do you need? What do you want? And we're going to speak to those variables that you need to speak to or at least answer, have an idea about uh, before jumping on or jump getting into these leagues. All right, that said, let's get into the United States youth soccer and the leagues within. Um, again, high-level overviews here. The Development Players League, these are all in alphabetical order, so there's there's no one was put in front of the other, just so we're on the same page. Um, this is all girls, uh, the, the DPL, and, and they were formed as an alternative to the girls' DA that was once a part of everything in, in the, higher, um, the, the higher levels of U.S. soccer. Um, and, and this 
league looks to put girls in professional environment and as well as college. E64, which is Elite 64, is the, the E. That's what it stands for. Um, they're regional leagues, which, which essentially offer an, a national competition or championship structure at the end of their seasons. Um, ECNL, which is your Elite Clubs National League, uh, they compete on a national level. So when we speak to variables, you know, you're going to hear about regional league. You're going to speak about, we're going to speak to national leagues. Um, travel is, is obviously going to be one of the variables we will speak to. When you see the second bullet there, or the first bullet underneath, the what? ECNL regional leagues, elite level national league, they're limited to playing teams essentially within their own region. The GA is uh, the, the girls' academy, and, and they were basically put together to replace the girls' DA. And again, high level, uh, putting girls in the collegiate and professional game. Uh, the equivalent to that, and we'll speak to this in a moment when we see the pyramids, but on the boys' side, uh, the MLS Next was, was put together to replace the boys' DA. Um, and this is one of the highest, or if not the highest level for boys' soccer. Uh, they're affiliated with the MLS clubs. Um, so again, MLS being our professional environment here in the United States. Um, and there is a direct pathway from the academy within the MLS Next programs um, into the professional environment. The National, oh, the National Premier League, um, they basically are, or what, what some of the requirements are is they, re, they require a club to have teams in all age groups. Um, they're organized by the National Conference Leagues, which are broken down obviously by region. Um, so you play specifically in your within region. Um, they do offer, as you see here, the Elite National Premier League or the ENPL, which is the highest level under NPL. These guys are similarly, excuse me, these teams competing against similar teams in their region and nationally. USL Academy um, is new. It, it's also been very successful and it's a regionalized competition. There's a minimum standard, um, but they emphasize a holistic approach. And essentially they include everybody. And, and that's meaning it's not a, a pay for play type of environment. Um, there's limited travel involved uh, for its for its members. Um, but again, it is at a, at a very, very high level. National League conferences are essentially, um, which, what you see there is you're gonna have regional leagues. Those are the regional leagues, excuse me, of the NPL and the ECNL. And the big bag of now, with, with, with that said, that is a very high level of the eight leagues we're going to discuss and put into a um, pyramid structure. Before we go anywhere, Coach Brett, Coach Blodge, Coach Paul, is there anything that you'd like to add or is there anything I may have missed? And again, your high level overviews, but anything you'd like to add? <clears throat> no, I mean, it, the only thing I'd say is th this is, I think out of all the countries in the world, and I've been in quite a few, in different capacities we are by far the most confusing uh country as far as the leagues go um so know that if you're confused that's probably more normal because it is it is perpetually changing and it makes very little sense on, for multiple ways but you know we're going to try and help clarify it for you yeah and i just want to say that i go along with brett right there i know that the parents ask me here in jersey about different leagues and there are so many of them that I, I have to be honest with you, I get confused myself. So this presentation is alert. It's going to be a, an additional learning experience for me as well. But there are multiple, obviously you see there's multiple leagues, multiple levels, and you have to really do your homework and, and set your priorities to figure out what, what is best for you guys. Well said. <clears throat> well said. Well, let's get into the pyramid structure. We're going to start with the boys. Uh, Coach Brett, I'm going to turn this over to you, if if I could, and and have you start this. If I uh, let you kind of introduce this pyramid structure in regards to the leagues, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I've coached in every one of these levels along the way, and we've been to give you an idea on my perspective. We've been consulting clubs for 20 years, and pretty much all over the country. One of the things that that has given me a little advantage on is 
uh, these leagues in this pyramid here. So this is the overall period pyramid. This should be the ranking. But I'm going to tell you, as we get into this, you're going to find out um, in different regions, it's not necessarily this. This is kind of an overall summary. And so we'll kind of go through it, but know that some regions, uh, other leagues are higher. So I'll kind of try to touch on that and, and some of the reasons why. But uh, it starts out, so you, you start out with the local local recreational leagues. You move up into your state competition leagues. Sometimes these are called, you know, uh, like gold, silver, bronze or elite or something like that. Um, then you begin to get into kind of this alphabet soup. So you start to get into the next tier, E64, NPL, in, uh, ECNL Regional League. And this is on the, on the boys' side. Um, that's probably that third tier down. And then what, you're, what you'll look at is then that second tier, you've got the USL Academy and you've got the ECNL boys, and then you've got MLS next on top. Um, there are exceptions. And I will tell you, does it mean that an ECNL team cannot compete with an MLS next team? No, it doesn't mean that. What it means is uh, that that league, uh, it has o an overall higher kind of weighted uh, ability than what the ECNL is, but there are plenty of teams on the high end of ECNL that will beat MLS next teams. One of the major differences that that uh, is between those two leagues, for example, or even USL and MLS next, MLS next to be a full participant, you cannot play high school and you cannot do ODP. Um, and there are some reasons for it. Uh, and if people have questions, we can hit that on the questions. But there are some teams that are just as good, but the players have decided we want to play high school. And so they've gone ECNL versus MLS Next. Um, there are parts of the country where the number of MLS Next teams are so spread apart that the amount of travel it would take to participate in it doesn't make sense. And so the, the club has decided to go ECNL, even though they might be capable of playing MLS Next. Okay. Um, and yeah, and it's, it is, each one of these has a different target. So MLS Next and USL Academy, to give an example on the boys' side, their stated target is professional soccer. So these are kids, uh, they are not trying to get the kids to college, um, although they both will admit that a lot of their players will end up there. But the stated objective of both of those is to get into the uh, professional leagues. ECNL is college. And then everybody down from there, the goal is college or fun, depending on how, how, uh, how far down the, the pyramid you go. So there are uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of restrictions you'll see with MLS Next uh, because the goal is they're not trying to build the well-rounded uh, social player. They are trying to build the next professional. And so that is why they have some of the restrictions on it. Um, on the girls' side, it's a little different. The girls' side, in theory, the way they wanted it to be was that the girls' GA would be at the top of the pyramid because it used to be the old development academy. But really, uh, on the girls' side, on the girls' side, the ECNL has had a stranglehold on the top level for quite a while. So ECNL girls is the top level for girls. And then you drop down USL Academy on the girls side is just coming online. So they've got a lot of teams, but they're, the quality is there, but the numbers aren't. Uh, the girls GA is also that second tier. Um, and all of them, though, their stated goal for the most part is college, although a couple will play pro. Um, once you come down to NPL, any of the EC, uh, EC, um, ECNL regional leagues, E64, so forth and so on, this is typically going to be the third tier uh, and it, it, within a club or within an area, and then down to state premier and so forth and so on. So that's a ton of information. These pyramids, the kind of the big thing to say is these pyramids are um, mostly true. Okay. Uh, for example, you know, college coach. So I've coached mostly at D1 level. Am I going to go on a boys' side if I have an uh, ECNL game and an MLS Next event at the same time? I'm probably going to go to the MLS Next event. If I'm on the girls' side, if I have ECNL and I have a GA competition, two tournaments on the same weekend, I'm probably going to the ECNL, most likely. Um, 
And then after that, it, once again, it's not a comment on the ability. There are great players, even on the girls' side. There are GA teams that will beat ECNL teams. But once again, the general, kind of the, the average of the league top to bottom in ECNL is slightly higher than the average top to bottom of GA. Brett, I'm going to halt yep. you right there. I thought yep. you did a phenomenal job on both pyramids, but I do want to turn it over to parents who might have yep. questions. Feel free to utilize the chat function, but at the same time, if there's anyone who has questions about this girls or the boys, please right now ask. Because if I were to put in my two cents, I think the first two structure, the, the MLS next, the National League in the, in the boys pyramid, that, that, that that's pretty accurate. Um, now the national slash regional leagues, those couple of leagues there, they're going to differ by region. And and, and yep. that's just where you are is going to attract different uh, the tastes, I guess you could say. But it's the same with when you look at the girls, that same national regional league conferences, those leagues are, again, by region. Some might be stronger than others. In one area, E64 might dominate. Or in another area, the regional league for ECNL might dominate. So just understand. And that's what, was, what was that, Brett? I was going to say the, the big one that jumps out to me is like when I was in the Midwest. So a lot of people, a lot of clubs in the Midwest didn't have access to ECNL on the girls or to MLS Next on the boys for a hundred different reasons. So now that NPL league is really the second tier of that area. So it's a second tier of players, but they are probably more in line with, say, uh, a second tier from another region, even though they're theoretically the third tier. Does that make sense? There is no first tier league available. So you are now, your area occupies the second and third tier. Doesn't mean that you really are second and third tier. It just means those are the leagues available to you. Coach Brett, great question in the, in the, in the uh, chat. Does the cost... Yeah increase as you play at the higher levels on this pyramid it um yes i'm gonna say in general now it's not necessarily exclusive ecnl uh most of the places i've been ecnl and mls next are pretty similar as far as their stated cost um but when you factor in travel uh it starts to they start to splinter apart so um one of the downsides of all of these top leagues all kind of competing with each other is is really a lot of these leagues have ended up traveling further to play teams that they could have played that were in their area all right what how do clubs determine which tier they participate in brett so some of them you have to apply for mls next you have to apply as a club and you have to meet uh, certain standards and it's not just a single team you have to prove that you have multiple qualities across uh, age groups. It includes coach education. It includes uh, being able to fill out a number, a set number of teams. You have to have relationships with other clubs in the area so that players filter into you. Um, and you get reviewed uh, in theory every two years. Now, whether that happens, some people will argue. Yes. That's on MLS Next. ECNL. You also have to apply. The standards are not as strict, but they are still pretty high. And you're look, they're looking for things like, uh, do you have a, a educated and competent staff? Do you have established curriculum? Uh, do you uh, have your teams competed well on a regional league or on a regional level, uh, tournaments and so forth and so on? And then after you drop down from that, USL is different. USL, you have to have a USL. Uh, championship usl1 or usl2 professional team on top and then an academy is always attached to it um girls ga similar requirements to ecnl um once you get down to regional leagues um e64 npl once again there is an application but the standards are less to get in um and they don't they won't bust your chops as much if you don't have the full complement of staff. Um, the licenses don't have to be as high, uh, so forth and so on. You're talking coaching licenses and having representation in every age group, correct? Yeah, exactly. 
Brett, how do you view the MLS next clubs that don't have an academy? And then the next question, same person, is it worth giving up being the quote unquote well-rounded athlete? <laughs> I like that. Question. Yeah. So is it, the first one, are you, is the first one, are you, is it, are you asking uh, the clubs that do not have the MLS, the MLS club on top? Um, Andrew, help me out with that. Um, how do you view the MLS next clubs that do not have an academy? Yeah. So like we have our, our team is an MLS next team, but we don't have an academy like Orlando city has an academy team. Right. We don't have that right. pathway at JFC. Yep. Yep. So, so I'll give you the behind the scenes version of what MLS next really is. MLS next is a way to simplify recruiting for all of the MLS clubs. So they formed a league and basically every club that's not an actual MLS uh, club uh, your goal is to find the, the best players in your you know, corner of the woods. You put them in a league. And the nice thing is now for like an Orlando, it's easy to recruit because everybody else has already filtered out the players for them. And they just go to the games and then go, hey, I like that kid. Hey, I like that kid. Let's pull him into Orlando. And then the, the, the quiet agreement is everyone, like, for example, the MLS Next Club I'm working with at the moment, uh, we're close to San Jose Earthquakes, but we, we are not an MLS club. If they if San Jose calls and says, "Hey, we want this kid," he's theirs. Like that. That's the agreement. Yep. Here you go. We're happy, and and we are happy to send him because that's a good opportunity. But it's really to simplify recruiting for the MLS clubs. So, um, is that in the kid's best interest? Um, depend. I'm going to tell you. It depends on the goal. It really depends. I was, so it depends on the goal, that, and, it, and that ties into the second half of the question. Is it worth it, um, being well-rounded? I'm going to tell you, and, and I've got a little perspective on this because I began my coaching in Germany uh, in the professional academies, and we used to tell every kid when they said, how do I, you know, what are my chances of being pro? And we would say pretty simple, 20 hours a week, the next 10 years, and you have a chance. And so by the time you actually think about that, like the MLS Next Club I train right now trains – four one and a half hour sessions that's six hours let's be generous and say two hours for a game on the weekend that's eight hours that means they've got 12 more hours that they've got to come up with on their own to have a chance at being pro and that is for some kids is that too much because it is it's, it's a lot of sacrifice it is a lot of sacrifice and there's no guarantee and so is it too much for some absolutely yeah, absolutely. It's too much. And, and I think some, some kids, um, you don't really know till you get into it, but I would tell a family, do not ever hesitate of dropping down to an ECNL or even an NPL, because really this is more about what is the right fit for the kid. And if the work, the sacrifice is way more than, than the, say the, what the perceived reward is. Yeah. It's not going to work out. It, it, the kid's not not going to be happy. Yeah, we're going to we're going to speak to that in a moment. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next couple of slides, but real quickly, two last questions. I'll answer the next yeah. one. Are there girls versions of MLS academies? Uh, my advice would be my is the GA. That's kind of what the girl the GA is. The girls academy. Um, there is no female version of MLS, so unfortunately, that would be um, and that's why ECNL kind of takes them over. Brett, would you agree with that? Yeah, the USL Academy is that, but it's in its infancy right now. So they're just getting even the women's, USL women's, the full professional version is still really coming online. But the USL Academy is a, a pre-professional type of progression. Um, and they probably have some pretty stringent. I would look to see NWSL uh, either join with USL or add its own in the next year or two. And you will see... Uh, an NWSL version of MLS Next would be the parallel, but it's not here yet. Got a, two, two questions. One I'm going to speak to and then push on to the next slide. The next one I want us to answer. Um, this one is from Liz, parent of a girl U11 GK in the Northeast. Oops. Sorry. The busy up. Guys, if you're not on mute, if you could just mute just so we don't hear the background noise, that would be awesome. Sometimes it's just a little loud on, on our end here. Um, 
from Liz, parent of a girl U11 GK in the Northeast. How important is it to play in a pre-ECNL team at U12? Can she wait to try out to U13? A response to that from Josh, which is actually, I think, unfortunately accurate. There is a political piece <laughs> that we can get in uh, that kind of gets involved. And that is unfortunately true. Um, that, that said, I want to speak to that in the next slide because we're going we're gonna to get there in a moment. Um, question I want to throw out there to, uh, to, to, to Brett. ECNL girls are not offered in my area. Can you talk about the guest player or exploratory player that may only split showcase time? Yeah, so, so that, um, and we'll kind of circle around on this in a second, really as your kids are coming along, and, and for someone that's U11, let's say, uh, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's not as important for you to have all these plans and be all super serious about it, your kid's still a kid, <laughs> but it is important to kind of understand the game as it, as, as how this game is played, so to speak, as you go along, and what I mean by that is this you're really going to find out you need, there's two major components. And whether your kid is trying to go to college or just trying to have fun and play as high as they can, um, I need a developmental pathway and then I need a marketing and a showcase pathway. They both might be the same thing. But a lot of times, I'll tell you, they could be, they could be two different things. And what I mean by that, so in, in relation to your question, uh, a part-time or, or uh, cause all of these leagues have some version of a part-time participant. MLS next even has it. it's called MLS. Uh, you can be a futures contract and they get limited participation. That's usually for the kids that still want to play high school, things like that. Um, USL has a part-time uh, GA has a part-time. The part-time is usually uh, if that's what you have access to, that is 100% part of your marketing strategy. Now you might develop as well, but you're because you're part time, you're probably not getting the full brunt of it, of that development side. So it is 100% in your category of this is my marketing side. I'm going with them because I know there's going to be more college coaches at their event than maybe my alternative. Well said. Okay. One more question. I'm going to go to the next slide. I think Tony has a good question here. We passed on an invite from a. Uh, Hold on a second. Let me get to the slide here. Oopsie daisy. Come back to that. Here we go, boys. We have passed on an invite to MLS Next to play U13 ECNL. UCNL National. My apologies. So our son can, just so they can play JV, meaning play it with their club based on the MLS restrictions, and also have his own GK coach. GK coach. At what age would you recommend Hopping back to the MLS next. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, so just, it's a great question. Uh, just for I'll reference, give you my there, short... oh, what I meant is uh, the 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 club that the MLS next that we got invited to basically said, no, 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 you can't have your own private goalkeeping coach. You have, you can only use ours. And my son has been with him for three years. Um, and then, like I said, yeah, he got invited to play JV as a seventh grader. So just trying to understand what the right balance is. Thank you. Before before yeah. you get into that real quickly, I just want to talk about the goalkeeper coach thing. Here's you go to college to learn from many professors. You go to an academy to learn from many different coaches. If there's a coach telling you that it's his way or no way, I hate saying this. Walk away. It's not it's not yeah. true. I can't stress that enough. You need to be with different coaches to get a different perspective. And if they're restricting you to say, you can't do this or you can't do that, that's hard for me. For me, this is my opinion, by the way. This is me. Uh, anyway, thank you for the clarification, Tony. Brett, thoughts? Yeah, for sure. So um, MLS Next or ECNL, uh, and this will segue into thing I think we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah, we're going to get there. Um, your your primary objective and honestly forget about all these badges forget about ecnl forget about mls next forget about all that stuff your kid from uh 12 to 16 where's my kid going to learn the most yes. period yes period no question don't worry about whatever league you're in don't worry about the prestige of the league 
12 to 16, you are your job, if you want to call it a job, your job is to gather as many tools in the toolbox as you can possibly have. Real quickly. 16, real, yeah, go ahead. And, and Tony, that's why I say get in front of as many coaches as you can. To Brett's point right there. That's that's all. Yeah, and it and uh, and so at 16, now I've got I'm not I don't have all my tools. I've got a vast majority of tools. And now the question is, how can I bring these tools to bear on the weekend? And that's why colleges really start picking out kids from from this age group on because it's no sense evaluating a Ferrari halfway down the production line. I'm going to wait till the Ferrari's done and then I'm going to decide is this one good or we're going to send it back. So there's there's a lot of people try to get into that and, and it's a mess. And I'll tell you, uh, MLS Next, even if they tell you you got to be in it, and I and I can say this coming from the inside, MLS Next has the highest rate of attrition at the U15 and U16 level. So seven, so I'm working, one of the teams I work with is U14. I can tell you just historically, 75% of the kids are going to get replaced over the next two years. No matter how good a job we do with them, no matter how good, 75% are going to come from outside the club. So being at the club, um, did it give them an advantage? It did. But as you can kind of guess on any team that you've ever been on, not every kid is maximizing the information given to them. That's just the truth. Like they, they have access to great information at MLSNet. That's, that's true. And I would say that's generally true across the country, but not every kid takes advantage of it. Not every coach is absolutely fantastic at communicating that knowledge. And so there could be a kid from outside the system that is, chucking along, chucking along, chucking along. And by U16, they're better. And they yep. come to a tryout. And MLS Next is real clear. We have, we are mandated to have the best players in the area. To, to that point, it eliminates all political stuff. So there was a question earlier about the political stuff. And I agreed with the the, the comment that was underneath it. Um, you know, I'm at this age and, and I there's political stuff. When it gets to a certain point though, Politics go out the window and results only matter. And and that's yep. to me, that's an interesting point there. That's a I think that's a great point. Um but I, I definitely would if if you take anything prior to say at least you fifteen, but I'm gonna even tell you sixteen, I would not worry about the badge as much as what am I going to learn? Which, and that is more important. Which brings us to our next slide, Brett. <laughs> 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 and I mean this, this is where, and I, and I can't stress this enough. Like I, if anyone coached, if anyone's kid was coached by coach Paul Blodgett, who coached Tim Howard, who coached Saskia Weber, both world cup participants, Saskia won a world cup, like won it. Like, and, and they were to say to you, Oh, by the way, you can't go to poach coach Blodge anymore. I would tell them go pound sand. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I, I can't stand that type of ignorance. So with, with this pathway for you, it's to coach Brett's point. I firmly believe that up to a certain point, it's development, 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 development. And, and I, Brett made a reference of U15. That's cool with me. I, I kind of agree with that, but especially if as a goalkeeper, Man, oh man, you're you got to get in as, as the education, you got to learn, you got it. There's so much you need to do that your club sometimes can't provide. So, if they mm. limit you, you you either do it behind the scenes or you tell them the pound sand. That said, pathways mm. do your research, keep your options open, especially goalkeepers. I can't stress that enough because you're you're a gem, you're, you're one of 11. That's that's and you are the only one of eleven. Um, measure the pros and cons. We, we, were, we were talking earlier about like travel and, and expenses. Like MLS next, you're going coast to coast. Like you are tra you are cost. It's it's expensive. I won't lie to you. So it's that pay for play mentality. Um, <laughs> in fact, this is the most important one of the one of the more important bullets. Is that that third one. Who, who are you signing up with? Who's in front of your children? What, what's your team coach like? What's your goalkeeper coach like? In your club, what's your goalkeeper coaching? What's your goalkeeper program like? Do they educate you? 
do they just put you on the end of the, do they put you at the end of the field for an hour and just shoot on you once a week for an hour and tell you that's training? Like, I, anywho, if you, the higher up you get, you're going to be limited game time. I can't, unless you're that number one and the only number one, there's an opportunity. You might lose out on game time. And as you get older, you want game time that translates into the collegiate game. So what's that risk? And this is the pay to play piece that I cannot stand and why I'm a, a kind of a more of research I've done, the more of a fan I am of the USLA or the Academy, because they are all inclusive and they try to bring even those that can't afford it into it. What's the financial investment? You know, what, what, what can you afford? There is a pay to play system, unfortunately, here in the United States. And, and then lastly, and most importantly, and I can't stress this enough, what are your goals? It's okay to play on a rec team if you're just looking to have some fun. It's okay to push and push and push to be on that highest level team because your goal is to play in college, to play D1, to move on and put play professionally everyone's goals are different and that's why we say there what is your pathway coach coach blodge i want to bring you on this slide because i I know a lot of these things mean mean a lot to you because i I know you've thoughts i'm just going to stop speaking what do you think coach yeah well i think you hit on some fantastic points and and one of the things that i think is that uh, at the younger ages, you need to be taught proper techniques so you can master the techniques properly so that when you are in the higher levels, you can start learning the tactics. If you have not been trained properly in, in, in mastering the techniques along the way and you get to the higher levels, you're going to fumble and bumble trying to go up for high balls a certain way or collapsing ball 1v1 situations. And then when, when you have to bring in the tactics of what the coach wants you to do, on top of that, then you might falter a little bit. So that comes back to who's mentoring you and teaching you along the way. And I think a, a word that everybody should understand and listen to is who's mentoring your kid. You know, it's not just who's teaching them how to how to catch a ball, whatever. Is the goalkeeper coach that uh, you're presently with actually mentoring your son or daughter to help them deal with the position? Uh, I think that's a greatly neglected part of, of the development of goalkeepers. They just throw the kids in there, uh, put them under sorts of, you know, hundreds of repetitions of something and then say, well, listen, we're training the kids and that's it. Well, the, the position is so much more to uh, than just, you know, keeping the ball out of the back of the net. It involves leadership, it involves character, it involves communication. All these things have to be considered in a development of the, of the goalkeeper. Um, and then the other points are too, like, uh, what are your, your soccer goals? And I, you, I think when it comes around, you have to be very honest, especially as a parent, you have to be very honest what the level of your child may be. I, I see too many times a parent's ideas of what they want their kid to be is not number one, what the kid might want but also it might not be within the actual physical or ability of the kid to be able to reach certain levels for whatever reason. So you need to have that honest conversation with your child and hopefully that your child will be honest in their expressing what they want to do. Um, I tell a lot, of, so I see some kids just say, they just want to be, have, uh, enjoy the high school experience. They want to enjoy the club experience. And when they go to college, They might not want to play at a collegiate level, but they might want to play club ball at the collegiate level. Now, club ball at the collegiate level now, I mean, when I was in college, it was intramurals. Now you play other colleges. It's it's like it's like a a a a college experience of playing without the NCAA being involved. And it's a tremendous experience for these kids and they love it. They travel. They play against other college clubs teams. Um, it's, It's just like it doesn't have the pressures of being involved with a collegiate program, which could affect their uh, their college experience, could affect their grades, uh, and all those other factors that you should be getting out of college. So 
make sure that you, and I, I agree totally with, with Eric too. If, they, if somebody tells you you can't train with somebody else, I would, I would not go to that person because I encourage all my goalkeepers I've ever trained to train under somebody else. Go experience another goalkeeper coach because the beauty of our position, which I think is unique, is that I could learn from Eric. I could learn from Brett. I could learn from somebody else. And what you do, you mold your own personality out of that. And that is the beauty of this position because you can take all this information from other people and develop your own playing style, your own way of doing it, and you can be an individual about it. So um, uh, take the time to research what the, at each level the club offers. I think another very important factor is playing time. You have to play. Yes. Uh, if they say, okay, you're going to, at these younger ages, they say, listen, we're going to play you for a half and then maybe you get on the field for a half. Well, I don't really have a problem with that because you are actually getting experience of being in the goal, but you're also still developing your, your playing skills, your foot skills, your, your team skills, uh, which is very valuable in the, in the game today for us. Um, and then you do not want to go all of a sudden to like a higher level team. And then they tell you, listen, you're not going to play. Um, and I think that gets, they might sell you the, you know, the bill of goods and, and then they get in the, and you, you sign up with a certain club. Uh, and then all of a sudden your, your son or daughter is not playing. And now just think of how that's going to affect everything about them. You know, it could affect your, even their, your, their, their opinion about wanting to play the game anymore. And the thing I cannot stand is kids losing the interest in playing the position or playing the game because people are telling them what to do. And they don't have the choice of their, of doing what they want to do. And I always tell my kids, listen, I don't care if you're going to be a division one college player. I don't care if you're going to be a pro, if you just want to play for your club, if you just want to play for high school, we will help you. We will give you tools like Brett said uh, to help you be the best you can be, whatever level that is. And I firmly believe that. So those, those are types of things that you have to kind of research yourselves to, um, uh, is this, are these things being offered to my child? Is my child going to get the most out of the experience? Are they going to allow my child to grow, ask questions, develop, or are they going to basically tell them what to do all the time? So, um, and out of all the positions in the game, this is the one that needs individuality. It, it needs a, a, a specific attention and it needs mentorship. And uh, those are types of things that you have to, uh, uh, kind of ask yourself honestly, because I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, a lot of parents have inflated ideas about what their kids can do. They they kind of think what they um, uh, what they might want their kids to do, but does their kid really want to do it? I'll give you a quick example. I had a very excellent, superb goalkeeper who played uh, for a very high level club here in New Jersey. He was getting Division One offers, full rides to play. The kid was six three. He was a stud and a very intelligent kid. He eventually, when it came down to really choosing a college, his parents kept pushing D1, D1, D1. He came into them at, at late at night and actually went into the room and started crying and says, why don't you just let me do what I want to do? Why don't you let me go where I want to go? So they finally said, okay, well, he went to a D3 school, two-time All-American, won a national championship, so set all sorts of records, got a tremendous education, one of the higher level institution, you know, uh, colleges in, in, in the country, and now he's having a fantastic life, all because he wanted, you know, his parents finally said, okay, we just got to let our son do what he wants to do. So, uh, you know, sometimes you have to be honest with the parents, get off your high horse a little bit, if I may say it that way, and let your kids express what they want. And then as a parent, I know that's what you will want to do for them anyway. Anyway, wow. that's a lot of information. That's a lot of information. In the, no, in I, I think, Blige, what you said, I'm going to piggyback off it. And I'm not only going to add, I'm going to add to what you said in, in one word, coaches. There's an, e there's an ego, unfortunately, with coaches, too, about pushing their players to play just so the club can get the recognition of pushing players into a respective D1 program. We put so and so into a D1 program. Come play with us. Don't be part of that marketing crap. Mm. I'm sorry, I hate, I hate to be blunt. Like your kid is that this is going to impact them for the rest of their life. The decision to play in college or go to college to play, 
and you're going to need an education. You're going to impact them for the rest of their life. So don't listen, but be very cautious of the purpose of what they're looking to do. Question here. And this is uh, is to to everybody, Ash, and I'm I'm not actually might take a crack at this myself on this answer. If we have limited access to anything above NPL leagues, would because of time sacrifice, logistics, totally understand that's all around the country, believe it or not. Can ID camps in actively pursuing colleges on your own cover the gap? I'm going to answer this as a college coach. Absolutely. Go if if you know where you're looking or what you're interested in from a college perspective, and and they have an opportunity of the, from an ID clinic perspective, attend, go, mm. absolutely mm. go, because they will look at you and they don't care what your background is. They might look at you and be like you know what, stud, let's talk, and and and. Just because they didn't find you at an ECNL showcase for girls or an MLS showcase for the for the for the boys, you know what I mean. It it's okay. Like, like there are different pathways for everybody, and that's okay. Like please understand. Maybe I'd like to jump in on that. I I always try to get the, any of the goalkeepers that I help through the college selection process and the parents be proactive. Don't think about being involved with a, a certain level on the pyramid that you're just going to go to these tournaments and a college just might pick you out of the, all the other people there. Agreed. You need to, you know, if you want to, if you know what you want to be when you grow up, start looking at schools that offer those opportunities. If you don't know what you want to be when you grow up, that's still okay. But don't just go to ID camp because you went to a tournament. And a college just says, listen, we saw at this tournament, we want you to come to our ID camp. And all of a sudden you have, you know, 25, 30 ID camps to go to. Well, that turns into a bunch of, yeah, that's a lot of money. So just be, just be wary. Okay. Uh, if there's, if the uh, son or daughter has an inclination that ah, I, I have an interest in that school, well, by all means go to the ID camp. And that way you and the child get a chance to experience what the school is a little bit, what the coaching staff is a little bit, and vice versa. Uh, and the same the thing, if you are going to, um, if you're going to be in a certain tournament and you have a certain interest in the college, contact them and tell them, so this is, I'm, we're going to be here. I'm going to be playing at this such and such a tournament. I'd uh, love to have you, one of your staff, especially your goalkeeper coach, um, come watch. And then, and then, uh, then follow up afterwards. So, and you'll find out quick enough if the college is serious about you, they will get back to you in a timely fashion. If you don't hear from them and they keep putting you in the bottom of the pile, uh, then you got to understand, okay, well, this is not the school that, that we should be looking at. There are thousands of colleges out there. Okay. And the other thing you got to be honest with is my, you know, number one, does my son or daughter want to play D1? Do they want to play D2? They want to play D3. You know, D1 schools are more of a, a, for lack of a better way of saying it, a job. Okay. The D1 coaches have to win because that's their job. If they don't win, they're going to get let go and somebody else will come in. Um, so it's more of a 12 month of a year commitment. As a goalkeeper, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, if you happen to be the number one, if you go to a school, you can almost be guaranteed that that school is going to bring in another quality goalkeeper in the next year or two to compete against you because they have to be two or three goalkeepers deep. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I was at Rutgers in one game in five minutes, we went from the number one to the number three by two injuries. And the number three was like, (laughs) he was freaking out because he said, I got to go in there now and play. So, um, uh, Division three, and like where division three, some most of your division three schools are some of your best educational institutions in the country. Very high level academics. And if you're a kid, like the kid I was telling you about that went and played D3 level and started for four years, had a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous experience. And then, you know, you might have a chance to be in the NCAA tournament every year. You have a chance to excel and enjoy your whole college experience. Because division one, you might sit the bench for two years before you even have a shot. 
because you have you to. Never, get, you may never get on the field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because it's the game is so much faster. The tactics are different. And then the competition is extremely fierce. So what is that going to do to your college experience? Is that, are you going to, are you able to, to sit on the bench for two years and try and get a shot your junior year? What's that going to do to your overall college experience? Is it going to affect your academics? Is it going to affect your social life? Will it make you depressed? All these kinds of things. So, you know, that's why this, this decision when it comes to preparing for colleges, making a college decision, the pathway you take, you know, it's, it's some serious stuff. And, and that's why you got to really sit down and, and, and plan it out. Lodge, I'll throw on, awesome. I'll throw on awesome. a, a slight. Brett, go ahead. I'm just going to throw on just a slightly, it's just some of the same stuff, but a slightly different perspective. So this is one of the things I talked about when, it, when you have a developmental plan and you have a, a marketing plan. So a kid who's, who does have access to, say, MLS Next or ECNL, my chances of getting lucky to getting seen Hopefully I'm good enough, but I am going to be a little more lucky than a kid who's NPL because I'm just, I'm fishing in the right ponds, but it doesn't mean that there aren't good players. And every college coach knows this. Every college coach knows there are players playing in NPL, some in state leagues, some not even in any of these leagues. I knew a best player a couple of years ago played in a church league in St. Louis, best player in the country, not a single, had never played club ball at all. But the problem is, as much as every coach knows there's a theoretical player out there just as good as the ones I'm looking at, it's very inefficient to go looking for them. Mm. So what your adjustment needs to be is your adjustment needs to be, okay, so I'm, I'm playing in NPL because that's the highest I've got access to. Great, no problem. Maximize my development. Keep going that way. Be as good a player as you can. And then also know I'm going to have to be a little more specific about my marketing plan to colleges than what an MLS next kid has to. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It doesn't mean, so like I said, uh, an MLS next kid might not even think about it going to an ID camp or barely think about it because he, he thinks, well, I'm going to see enough people at my showcase events already. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But, a kid who's playing NPL, yeah, I'm going to have to be a little bit more deliberate in my marketing by the time I start trying to connect to college because they're not naturally going to come to the places I'm at, but it doesn't mean a connection can't happen. Great. Point. And I'll give you, yeah, and I'll give you an example on the IT camps. So most of them, and I think, uh, not trying to disparage anybody, but most of them are money makers. And I think everybody has a sense of that. So if I say ID camp, first of all, I can call the state association as a college coach. I can get everyone's email and then send out, send out a letter saying, hey, we really like uh, you. You're a good soccer player. Come to my ID camp for 150 bucks. Thank you very much. And everyone thinks that, that oh, my gosh, they really picked me out. No, they got a mailing list and they send it to you. So that's probably the reality. But with that also being said, uh, a lot of colleges will have, let's say they have three of these ID events. And they're always going to have one if they're smart. They're always going to have one late summer. And the reason why they're going to have it late summer is because they're going to bring in their incoming freshmen to come to the camp. And it's an early preseason. But the reason why you want to ask that question is look for that time. Because now I can go in as, you know, I'm just Joe Bag of Donuts. They don't know who I am. But I'm going to be playing against kids that they're bringing in this year. And they've probably asked a couple of their really high level recruits to come in and play again because they want to do an apples to apples comparison. I want, if I really know this kid, I want to see how he does against my kid. Plus they're going to have a couple of their own college players be uh, coaches. So it's an early, early preseason. But my point is, is even if you're not really deliberately there, you're still there. And if they see you do some nice things against current players, that really helps them on their confidence level of, this kid could play here. Yeah, I love it. I mm -hmm. love it. Very good, Brett. That's, that's yeah. good stuff. <clears throat> Guys, I'm, you've given us so much time tonight, and we appreciate that. But I'm just going to go here, but go back to the same slide, the side before, which is questions. We What questions do you have? I'm, I'm just going to kind of leave it there. And if you don't, that's totally understandable. We've been hitting them off of the chat function with – this whole session. If you have anything, please let us know. You have it. You have this opportunity now. While you think, contact information is here. 
Go ahead, Brett. I've got I've got one last piece of advice, and this is more for the kids, kind of let's say pre sixteen for sure. Uh, for me, the holy grail, if you can find it, once again, regardless of badge, is that your kid is the club is going to let the kid play on two teams. One is a team where it's going to challenge him, and the environment's hard and and challenging, and this and that. And then they're going to also let him play or her play on a second team where the team's not that good, and you're going to get pounded with shots. And but you can experiment with things. So you've got one environment where you can work on technique, you can experiment with things, and honestly, you, you're just gonna get blasted. And honestly, I would say you want you you kind of hope that the team's not that good because you're uh, you want to get the reps, yeah. and then go back to your other team and work on pitching the shutout and all the normal things of a goalkeeper. But um, I would tell you from we used to do it in Germany systematically. We put keepers on two teams always. And they would get one was supposed to be challenging and one was supposed to be one where they experiment and work on things. And I'll tell you, I've never seen keepers learn faster than when they have those dual environments. So if you can find that, who cares about the badge? Uh, if it's good training and they've got a dual environment, that's a that's kind of the unicorn that's out there. Love it. I'm gonna, two, two last questions, guys, that we're going to wrap up here. Unless you guys have more questions, please type them in or jump in. One, how often... Will clubs be dropped from, say, an ECNL conference? Brett, I'm going to rely on you on this. I'm, I'm my pop, my, I'm guessing it has to do a lot with results and a uh, promotion slash. Um, yeah, you would you would think so. The so there's the paper version and then there's the real version. The paper <laughs> version is is in theory you could be dropped. I think most of these high leagues say. Hey, if you don't keep the standards, you could be dropped within two years. And the reality is they like money. So they're not going to drop most of them. That's just the reality. The, I mean, the leagues, the leagues like money. So they're going to put someone on probation and double, double secret probation. And hey, we're really serious this time. Eventually, yes, they, they, will, cut, they will cut some teams if they just cannot perform at all. But um, most of the times what I've seen is you'll see somebody, they'll invent suddenly a second tier league and it'll be ECNL two or MLS next two. And, uh, you know, the quest for more money. So <laughs> they're, they're not going to tell, you no, as long as the checks keep, keep clearing the <laughs> bank. So that, I mean, but in reality, yeah. Could they be dropped? Sure. They, uh, by on paper, they could be dropped every two years. Um, has, does it happen as much as it should? No, that's that's one of the bigger complaints at all of these top leagues and why some new ones keep starting up is because they said, hey, you promised you were going to keep the standard very high. And, you know, we got a bunch of yahoos running around that aren't even close to the standard. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's the uh, it's the well, you wish it wasn't that way, but that's yeah. how it is. All right, last question. We're going to wrap her up here. Follow-up question. Best time to start, quote, unquote, marketing your goalkeeper. Is that the age that, uh, I'm sorry, is U16, is that the age that college coaches also really get serious about looking at players? I'll, I'll, Before that. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, I'll take that. Yeah. So I'm a college coach. What we look at is a a need and a necessity. You plan goalkeepers in recruiting um, more than other positions, to be perfectly honest with you. And you need to make sure that if you have a freshman couple, you, you, what's the next cycle? So whenever that is, what is the next cycle of goalkeepers that you're recruiting to coach Brett's point earlier? And, and and it's just a matter of reaching out. It's a matter of ID clinics. It's a matter of identification. It's a matter of getting in front of them from a microscope perspective. And that goes to the, um, back to the pyramids. Like where are those coaches going? Where are they going for showcases? Where are they going to see these players from a recruiting perspective? Um, but it also goes to if you're 15, 16, and you then go to that big club, to then get spotted, will that be a negative? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, no, it won't. So again, it's back to what's your pathway, what's your development pathway, because everyone's different. 
All right, last comments for Coach Blodge. I'm going to leave with you if I could, sir. Yeah, the one thing, I just was up in a, uh, with a, an ID regional tournament for ODP in Albany, New York. I just drove down from that. And uh, there were teams from New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and Jersey. And the thing I, I, I kind of like about, I know ODP varies according to the region you're in. It seems to be more prestigious some places than others. Uh, it's not what it used to be. But what I do notice is there's a lot of kids, especially at the Jersey level, that can't afford some of these clubs. And so ODP is a less expensive option, but at least these kids now have a chance to go to like an ID regional tournament um, or they have their tournaments at the end of the year against other like a regional tournaments at the, uh, at the end of the year um, and college coaches do attend no. So just because you can't afford um, maybe some of these other options, research and see other possibilities that might exist for exposure for, for your son or your daughter as well. Well said, sir. Yep. Coach Brett. Yeah, I would say, you know, go out and you, you'd you be surprised some of the work you can do early. Um, a lot of kids, when you start this whole ramp up through through college and whatnot, if you ask a kid, hey, what do you want to study? Where do you want to go? The answer is usually, I don't know. And so what you, but what I found doing a lot of workshops is like a 14 year old kid is pretty decent at saying what he doesn't want or she doesn't want. So like, I, I do want to go to, you know, to the middle of the country. I don't want to go to the middle of the country. I do want a small school. I don't want a small school. I want to be in a big city. I don't want to be in a big city. And so I think you could start to even that work of, if you just start with what don't, I don't want this. Um, you know, there's schools out there that are all girls schools, all boys schools, and maybe they don't want that. All right, good. Go through and sort out and make cross as many off the list as you can with the I don't. And then as you get, as they get older, they'll start to figure what they do want, but it's a good place to start. And then you can start to do, I'll, I'll, I'll encourage one last thing. You can do a little research. So I was a, I was a coach at St. John's in New York and we had uh, some kids, I worked with some kids in Brooklyn. They're like, oh, I, well, I want to go to St. John's. And you're like, okay, that's great. Let me, let me tell you how to research it. And I'm only, I'm not saying it to plug St. John's or not. I'm saying the process is the important thing. So you want to go to St. John's. So go to St. John's website and they're going to have an announcement of, hey, this was our signing day announcement. Find the most recent one. Okay. It'll be in the archives. It'll be on all their websites and you'll read through it. And they'll have like a little paragraph blob of all the new kids coming to St. John's and somewhere in that blob, they're going to tell you where they found that kid. Oh, we saw Brett playing at uh, ECNL in this thing. We saw Brett uh, doing this. We saw Brett at our ID camps. And he kept coming to our ID camps and we offered him a scholarship, whatever the story is. But now you get a really good look at where they like to go fishing for players. And each school is different, but you'll find it in, in, that, in that press release. But they'll tell you, if you read through it right, you'll see it. It'll tell you where they like to find players. So if you see one school says, oh, we found him at MLS Next and this guy played MLS Next and this other guy played MLS Next. Well, then you know, okay. If I really want to go to that school, MLS Next seems to be the place how I need to go there. But not every school is going to be that way. So now you really start to refine down what, kind of like what Eric said earlier, what is right for my kid? Yeah. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Oh, boy, everybody. Well, listen, I'm happy with how everything went down. If there's any questions... If there are any concerns or if you have more, anything, whatever you need, that's what we're here to do. We are here to provide you with questions, I'm sorry, answers to your questions. We are here to provide you with guidance. We are here to provide you with everything and everything we can from a goalkeeper perspective. So please reach out. Please ask questions. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook. And I can't ask enough to say, please join us. Please become a member. The, 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 the insides and the education of what we provide, I believe, 
is first class and will help you get to your next level, whatever that level might be. Coach Brett, Coach Blodge, thank you for the your help tonight and your support tonight. We appreciate both of you, your knowledge, your insights, everything you do for goalkeeping in this country is unprecedented. So thank you for your involvement there. Parents, um, some of the questions I'm seeing about recording. Yes, the recording will be available. I will post that not only on social media in the upcoming days. This will also be in Friday's UGKA newsletter. If you're not a member of the newsletter, please send me a DM at, at United GK Alliance on Instagram or an email at info at unitedgkalliance.com. Everybody, thank you so much. Have an awesome week. We appreciate all of your support. And if you ever have questions, concerns, thoughts about what we can do, to help our clients, which are your children, please reach out. Have an Thank awesome you. week, everybody. Thank you very much.